Welcome back to the Hyperbolic Coding Chamber. We are back once again. The holidays have left us. Uh, the We had a very great Merry Leetsmas yesterday. Many problems were done. Many problems were slain, which begs us to ask the bigger question. Are things getting too easy? So initially, we were going through problems around, uh, I think it was a month ago or two months ago. I said we were going to start doing easies only. So we started doing easies only. And then I think we're like, that was like, that was like 180 easies ago. Because <laughs> since then, we've done many a problem of any and easy. And yeah, at this point, we're kind of blowing through them. I think yesterday we did like seven, six or I don't remember it was six or it was five, six or seven easies in an hour. Which is probably a good sign because we're being, uh, I think we're starting to intuit the natural properties of easy problems. So maybe this is ideal. So that's pretty cool. But I wonder if it's not, if it's getting a little too easy. Some of the problems you run into, we haven't really had to think a lot about. And that's a good thing because it means that the time we spend thinking per problem is somehow being compressed in our neural network into a smaller or more proficient decision tree, which is allowing us to take less time. So that's pretty useful. I imagine it's a lot like League of Legends, where the time you spend, I guess everything is like this, but I remember reading a book and it mentioned that the greatest way to tell whether or not a player would become the best chess player was uh, the greatest determining variable in whether or not a player would reach Grand Master or something like that was how much time they spent studying old games. This is probably because by doing this, you have to think about why someone made a move. And I think uh, this ties back to League in the sense that you do a VOD review, right? Or even when you're in lane, how much time you spend thinking before you make your next move makes you a better player. Hopefully, though, later on, you can't spend six minutes deciding whether or not to kill a minion. But by spending those six minutes exploring all those options, in a sort of weird way, you create a compressed version of that that you can access in shorter time. So... I presume this is how legendary players in every facet of game are able to make these really highly detailed uh, solutions that happen in like a few seconds, whether it's football, soccer, league, or any other esports, or just other stuff too, like gymnasts can make a good uh, decision based off a little information. So that's pretty dope. So I think we're getting there. I don't think we're always going to solve every day that we do an hour. It's going to be the best we're going to solve as many problems as we did before because I've never solved that many problems in an hour before. Granted, they're all easy, but that's never happened to me before. So hopefully it continues from there. I was expecting an exponentiation in power, in power and it is beginning. So hopefully it continues. I could be jinxing it. It could get a lot worse from here and we could solve one problem per day, which I presume will happen when we get to mediums. But yeah, if we could keep going... The minimum I planned was three problems, each medium, each easy should take at most 20 minutes. And then uh, that would be three problems a day. Uh, we do an hour every day. That's like 30 problems every 10 days. Average month is 30 days, 90 problems a, a month. That would make us get to the remaining. We have about 400 problems remaining. That would get us done all the easies in about like four months. But if we went faster, we could cut that time. So that would be pretty cool. Then we could go to mediums, and then we'd start making a lot of progress. So that would be pretty dope. But we're not really being challenged a lot. So hopefully we, now we can keep burning through. I think it's just some categories of mediums we already know how to get through. For example, if it requires a specific use of a data structure like a stack or uh, a queue, the ones that require heaps... We don't know how to implement a heap, so and we have every problem that that could have been optimized with a heap. We've been able to find a solution that is not a log of n, but it's close enough, so it doesn't really feel like we need the heap. Uh, oh yeah, a lot of the tree problems, it's like basic DFS or BFS stuff, or uh, like a combinatorial problem with some heuristics applied on top, so. All to say things are going well. Hopefully they continue to go well. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see how things continue to go. 
Fortunately, we have some comments from our legendary humans over at the Hyperbolic Coding Chamber from Jeans Zero, pouring one out for game dev. True. True indeed, but this is just to say that it's still happening behind the scenes. It just it feels easier to make uh con it feels easier to make content that would be compiled into one video rather than uh content compiled into one video rather than making a low f a low effort video every day that doesn't get compiled into a larger video because the channel has to grow as well because part of being a game dev in 2022 is being the marketing guy you got to be the the tiktok guy so if you guys might see me making some tiktok where i have to dance i might have to get sturdy for the for the to, to promote the game so <laughs> that's where we're at so that's part of the reason to the shift to the more uh serious content not serious but more devlog style content because that seems to be the hotness in game dev so it seems like no matter how small your game dev channel is, if the game seems interesting enough, people will click. So that's kind of the goal. So yeah, hopefully we can compile. I think maybe we'll could try to see if we can get our first compilation out on Friday. Or that's not really a week. Maybe on Sunday. The first compiled video out on Sunday will be pretty epic. So I think that's the goal. But yeah, the goal for today, however, is the return of LC. So, a necessary evil. <clears throat> so hopefully the music isn't too loud and we ruin the whole video. <laughs> but, okay, the whole thing just stopped. But, yeah, so that's going to be the goal. So we're gonna jump into the LC. I don't think we have any, did we solve this one already? We did array pair some. So now we just have pretty much nothing to start with. So we're just gonna have to find some new problems and then set our timer to get started. So. Here we have the beginning, and I'll refresh this page to see if there's any more. We have array transformation, hex speak, decoded, XORed array, monotonic array, relative sort array. Okay, so we'll try these and see if we can make any sense of them. So this is a premium problem with half dislikes, so Given an initial array R, make sure everything's recording. <clears throat> Given an initial array R, every day you produce a new array. Given an initial array R, every day you produce an array, a new array using the array of the previous day. On the ith day, you do the following operations. On the ith day, you do the following operations on the array of the on the ith day, you do the following operations on the array of day i, i minus one, to produce the array of day i. So if you want array of day i, you have to do the operation on array day minus one. If an element is smaller, <coughs> if an element is smaller than both its left neighbor and its right neighbor, then this element is incremented. If an element is bigger than both its left neighbor and its right neighbor, the element is decremented. The first and last elements never change. After some days, the array does not change. Return that final array. Definitely a peaks and valleys type vibe. On the first day, the arrays change from six to three, four to six, three, three, four, because the only ones we can change are two and three because the first and last would never change. So we increment two because it's in a, it's in a valley. And then we go through again, there's nothing to increment.
because there's no peaks or valleys. First array, go from one six three four four three five. One six three four three five two one five four three four five. So five is the only thing that ch no. Every lot of things change here. Six changes to five. Three changes to four. Three would technically be in a valley, so shouldn't it become four? So it looks like you can apply multiple operations and this whole day thing has nothing to do with it, but I'll read the wrong problem one more time. Given an initial array R, every day you produce a new array using the array of the previous day, which means we can modify R in place. On the ith day, you can do the following operations on array of day I minus one to produce the array of day I. I'm not certain why they're saying all this day stuff. The element is smaller than both its left neighbor it's right neighbor means that element is incremented I think we can just do what they do what they tell us to do here but it also feels like It seems like this might just be, let's see. It feels like this could also just be an averaging function. Because anything that is not the value slowly turns to the middle. So I wonder if we could do something where we just calculate the sum and then set all the values to the average. So let i equal to zero. Actually, we can just do the sum is equal to r. Actually, we wanna, actually, yeah, we can just do r dot reduce a plus b, right? And then we'll have to make sure that we subtract both the first element and the last element. And then we can say that the average is equal to sum, we'll say math dot seal of sum divided by r dot length minus two, because we want to ignore the first and last elements. From here, we can say let i equals zero, i equals one, i is less than r dot length minus one, i plus plus, and we'll just say r sub i equals average. This might be a Hail Mary.
What happened to the sum here? Why are we getting zero? We are getting five as our sum, which is good. If we do five divided by, maybe we have to put parentheses. Oh uh, yeah, it looks like we might have overfit too hard on the first two cases. It seemed possible though, because we're not too far off. Maybe there's just something else in the way of which one we should turn to. Because I'm saying seal, but for, how do we know if we should seal or floor? fact maybe this would give us some more what if we said what if we didn't subtract the values divided by the length and just did floor I think we could just do what they tell us to do, but it feels like this sense of them. This, this. I'm gonna get back to subtracting this. What if we did something wonky? Like if r sub zero is less than r sub r dot length minus one. So if one is less than five, then we'll take the ceiling. Otherwise we'll take the floor.
Hmm. One five minus one would give us four. Looks like uh, my power went out for a little bit, so the internet is not currently working. But it is questionable as to whether or not this would actually work. I mean, we already tried seal, so we know this isn't the solution. But we know that there's one more angle where this potentially could work. And one more angle, it could be the largest number, or the number on the right, the largest of the two, right? One, five, you get four. Right, and this happens to be the number they fill this in with. Now, if we take six and four here, if we do six minus four, add one, we get three, which would be median point between them. <clears throat> that could work. We had a case earlier where that didn't work, though. So, what if we did do that? I mean, we could always just do what they tell us to do. But the time complexity of that feels, I guess the worst case would be n squared, but I feel like there's an n so linear time solution to this. Hmm. So I think the last thing we'll try before we try and make them uh, or try and simplify them. The last thing we can do before we try and just do what they tell us to do, which we can implement, I think, in worst case, in uh, n squared time. So uh, other than that, I equals then. Uh, actually, it might be worse than n squared time. So, let me think. We'll, uh, we take the largest of the two, subtract them. Does it really matter if they're not ordered in the correct order? What if we had four here and six here? Six minus four would still give you, or four minus six. If we could just take the absolute value, which gives us exactly the same thing. And then, right, so I think if we do that, we'll have a new average. Well, first, we'll take, uh, I guess, the diff, which will be uh, r sub 0, or the math, the absolute value of r sub 0 minus r sub r dot length minus 1. And we can say the average, or maybe this wouldn't work. 
but if this new average would be equal to uh, if diff equals actually we need to know which one's largest so let's say uh, sub r dot length one or I guess either way if diff equals largest right then we get diff otherwise we're going to do diff plus one and I think that this could make sense So I can't click, click run until the internet returns.
Huh. So this does not work. Because this version, I forgot. Yeah, if it equals this, we want to subtract one. But actually, if it equals largest, if it doesn't equal, yeah. Even in the case where it equals smallest, we'll add one to it. Wait, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, we overfit again. This does not make any sense. Because we get something like 3 minus 3. I guess this would be an average if the numbers, I think I realized the issue. This would be an average if the numbers were bounded between the left side and the right side, but they're not. The thing is, though, if you take the average of just the center, you get 5 plus 5 is 10, plus 3 is 13, divided by 3 is 13 point. No, divided by 3 is like 13 divided by 3 is 4.3, which is technically the expected answer. But that original version doesn't really work like that. Actually, I'm kind of thinking about it. I know there's a linear time version to this, but let's just do what they tell us to do. Let's just do what they tell us to do instead. Uh, I have an op done equals false, right? And we'll have while op done while op while an operation wasn't done while an operation wasn't done what we're going to do is iterate from i equals one going up to i going up to r dot length minus one 
i plus plus and just like they say if we're a peak so we'll do peak valley if uh, r sub i is less if it's a peak then the values next to it are smaller than it so if r sub i is greater than r sub i plus 1 and r sub i is greater than r sub i minus 1 then you want to do r sub i is equal to r sub i minus 1 and you can do the valley right if r sub i is less than the one in front of it and it's less than the one behind it then it must be a valley and so we'll increment it right and then we'll change this to else if Uh, and then for both of these, we'll say opt-on equals true. Right, and then we'll set up here, opt done equals false. So while an operation isn't done, right, we'll set opt done equals false. It looks like a duplicate, but it is important. If we do an op, right, we'll set it to true, right? And if we go up top here, right, we'll say while, uh, oh, we wanna change this to while an operation was done, we'll start it to true. Uh, so we'll say when op was done, right? We'll say op done is equal to false now because this is a new day. Or we're going to start on a day. Uh, and then we're going to go through. Now, if an operation was actually done, right? Then we're going to go to the top and we're going to do it again. So we'll set equal to false, right? And if an operation was done, we're going to set the true. If an operation wasn't done, it's going to be false. And we should be able to exit and return the array. Wait, are we supposed to copy the array? That's the only way I see these differing like this. Because if you change, if this is a, a, a valley, 
you would add a two here, right? Then you wouldn't change two at all because there's no uh, peak here. But if you see this as, oh, you change it once and then you keep this, you check the two here, it would indeed be a peak. So you'd have to subtract it to get one here. So maybe you do have to copy it. So maybe we'll make a copy of it. If we copy it right after we're done, then we'll set it equal to that new array. Or we'll set uh, R equal to that copy. And the copy will be what we modify. But we just want to make, we just want to, we make the change. We, we'd like to have a version that we can use that's pre-change. So we can just say const copy equals R. And then when we use R here, we'll just use copy. But what we actually change will be Copy. So in this case, make a copy of six, two, three, four. We'll check if right two is less than six and less than three it is. So we change this to a three, but we'll change it in the original array, not the copy. I understand why this works, but I don't understand how long it takes. Oh, it's a simulation problem where you just have to run the simulation, I guess. mind it looks like everyone just runs a simulation Looks like we were right with the worst case being n squared, but maybe we spent too much time on this one. We'll go to the next one. So we have a problem called hex speak. A decimal number can be converted to its hex speak representation. A decimal number can be converted to its hex speak representation by converting, by first converting it to an uppercase hexadecimal string. Uppercase hexadecimal string, then replacing all occurrences of the digit zero with the letter O and the digit one with the letter I. Such a representation is valid if and only if it consists only of the letters in the set A, B, C, D, E, F, I, O. Given a string num representing a decimal integer n return the hex speak representation of n if it is valid otherwise return error mm -hmm. so the first part the n part makes sense 
Can a decimal number be converted to its hex feet representation by first converting it to an uppercase hexadecimal string? So we first have to convert the decimal number to hexadecimal. So for 257, that is 101 in hexadecimal. Since it's 101 in hexadecimal, we turn one and zeros to I's and O's. And then that's it. So we could just do decimal two hex uh, swap hex ones and zeros to i's and o's. Check the uh, return validity of hex speak. So if we could do decimal to hex, we could say hex equal to num dot two string and we'll just call it n I mean parse int of num and then from here I think we can just uh, convert it to hex as normal so one way to do that we can create uh, hex symbols, right? And we can create a new map, right? From an array of tuples such that we'll map a number to a symbol. And actually, we don't even have to do, yeah, we'll map a number to a string. And then from here, we'll get this, we'll pass in an array of tuples. So uh, to start, so we'd like the number zero to map to, we'd like the number one to map to A. And we're gonna have, I think hex has, Wait, I think there's a better way to check this. If the only numbers it consists of are A, B, C, D, F, I, and O, A, B, C, A is equal to 10, B is equal to 11, C is 12, F is six, F is, F is 15 and then zero being the 16th symbol. If that's the case, Actually, never mind. If this was true or false, if we were returning a Boolean, we could do it that way, but it doesn't really change anything. And one is not A. Uh, This is where 10 would map to A, 11 would map to B, C, D, E, F. C, 
six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, and then to convert it to hex, we could just do it as normal. Actually, I think there's a better way to do it with modulus. But I don't really know that way really well. But I do know that uh, the maximum number of the power that represents all numbers is like, for at least hex. The maximum places yeah I think it's uh, max probably like eight digits so if that's the case, I think we can just go from i equals eight, i is greater than or equal to zero, i minus minus. done this in a little bit but I think uh, the base it's usually something like uh, the base it's uh, the value right uh, times the base which would be 16 to the power right and what we're basically checking is that I is actually equal to the power right and then we're gonna have another loop right that also starts at the maximum value, which is gonna be 15, because the 16 symbol is zero, and i is gonna be greater than or equal. I think we can also just stop at. And then we're gonna do i minus minus, and this is basically how this is going to work. We're gonna calculate the value the value right times the base which is 16 to the power right and we'll say uh, if we're gonna have the number right what's this fat what's this variable even called it's called n right if n mod product equals zero which means it gives us no uh, Remainder it means it goes into it perfectly so we can subtract uh, from the number right So we pretty much like to know how many times it goes into it uh, How many times would be n divided by product so an example would be if we had something like 90 right and 9 to nine right the value 9 times 10 right which is the base to the second power 10 times 10 or to the first power 10 times 1 or yet yeah, to the second 10 times 10 no to the first yeah, 10 times one, right? Nine times 10, which gives you 90, right? If you did 90 mod nine, you would get no remainder. So how many times did nine go into 90? You take 90 and divide it by,
power. So we know it goes into it nine times. Then we'd say n minus equal product. Then we'd break, right? Because that would be the largest value we can get for that uh, place. Additionally, how many times it goes into it. times it goes into it would give us the symbol so we'd say x plus equal uh, x symbols dot get dividend and then I'm just going to print x see what we actually get and additionally we'll return an empty string to see if this gets us anything okay <laughs> And actually, we can solve the other half of the problem by changing i to 1 to i here and 0, zero to o. Maybe our dividend makes no sense. We'd be dividing. Yeah, n divided by 16 to the power. Oh no, what am I saying? The div no, what am I saying? The value is what the actual symbol is. Oh my god.
value is one, power is zero, and the product is one. Huh? Sixteen to the zero is one. One times one. What is going on? Let me just print N too. I, I'm confused as to why we're only getting one. Oh, it doesn't have to equal zero. I'm trolling. Oh man, this are, this is all over the place. As long as n is less than, as long as the product is less than n, uh, less than or equal to n. Then we'll return hex. Now we just have to check the validity, right? Uh, we know that A, B, C, D, E, and F was I. Oh, our valid characters, we can just say for const. You can say, uh, right, if, uh, set right doesn't have letter you want to return error Oh, this is supposed to be an O.
Oh, they want the string without the. Okay. Oof. Green packs equals. Wait, so they expected error. Maybe we didn't consider how large the numbers could be. The number represents 10 to the 12, which means we need to be able to handle mil thousand thousand million one trillion which means our power probably isn't going high enough 16 to the 8 does not give us enough but 16 to the 10 so if we change power to 10 I don't know if the direct classic JavaScript number can even Oh, okay. So it looks like that was issue and I think that's a good place to stop. <laughs> 